Welcome to Real Vision Crypto. I'm Ash Bennington. I'm joined today by Ben Cowan, founder and CEO of Into the Cryptoverse, here today to do a deep dive on technical analysis on Bitcoin and other digital assets. Ben, welcome back to Real Vision. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back. Let's dive right in. Yeah, so the first thing I, I really wanted to talk about, I think I spoke about this the last time, um, but it's just looking at the entire asset class as a whole of the entire cryptocurrency asset class. Uh, it's easy to, to focus on like one cryptocurrency, but really the, the entire asset class tells a, a pretty interesting narrative. And one of the things that I've found with an asset class that's currently going through, you know, macro price discovery where it's really being capitalized, people are really understanding what this stuff is going to be used for, is that the best way to model it, in my opinion, is through something called logarithmic regression. And the reason logarithmic regression works so well is because when, when you have lower market caps, as we know, it's easier to push prices higher. It takes a lot less volume to do so. But as the asset class grows, it takes more and more volume to really push the asset class higher. You know, it's easier to see a 10x in a smaller cryptocurrency by market cap than it is a larger one. But if you take the entire asset class as a whole and look at uh, look at this chart here, you know, back in 2011, 2012, the asset class was only like 10 million by market cap as an entire asset class. And then as it as it goes to the years, we obviously know it continues to move higher. But the reason logarithmic regression works so well is because these types of trend lines um, allow for more accelerated growth early on. But then as the asset class continues to grow and mature, that growth somewhat falls off a little bit. And so we want to sort of in, in, encapsulate that using just a single equation. And, and therefore, this is one of the reasons why I use this. And I think another reason is because because of the, the, the nature of logarithmic regression, it, it sort of intrinsically accounts for the idea of diminishing returns. And unfortunately, uh, diminishing returns is just you know, part of the game that we play. Um, and, and kind of recognizing that what was once possible on a weekend might not happen in a weekend anymore, but it could take you know a few weeks to play out or a few months to play out just because the market capitalization is higher. So as of March 18th, 2022, the entire asset class, uh, you know, when I put this presentation together a few hours ago, was at 1.82 trillion. But I believe it's actually gone up a little bit since then. It shows you how quickly things can change. The fair value, according to our logarithmic regression fit to all data, is at about 1.49 trillion. So a little bit, a little bit lower, uh, which represents a slight overvaluation of approximately 22%. But that overvaluation isn't really that bad. And you can look at the chart and see we go through long periods of overvaluation, long periods of undervaluation. But more or less, when you're right around that fair value. Um, it's it's not it's not a bad place to be. You know, you're not you're not super far extended like we were at the end of 2017. We're not even as remotely extended as we were back in early 2021. Even though the asset class as a whole is more or less around the same market capitalization, and the reason is because the fair value is a is a monotonically increasing function. So if we if we sort of stay at this value for the next three months, then the slight overvaluation will eventually become an undervaluation because we assume that the asset class's fair value sort of sort of grows with time. So that's kind of where we are right now, um, more or less right around the fair value. And it's been a fairly boring three or four months in the cryptocurrency asset class. I think the market is really adjusting to the new normal. Um, you don't just go up 10, 20 X by market cap without without paying the price for it a little bit and and having to having to have a boring market for a while. But that's sort of where I see us um, today, just slightly or, you know, slightly above the fair value, but we still could, you know, we still have a lot to give. Ben, walk us through those trend lines on the screen, the red line uh, and then the green bands around it. Yeah. So so the red line, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm minimizing the logarithmic. Well, I'm first of all, the first step is I'm minimizing the logarithmic difference between the market cap and the fair value. But the fair value is calculated through an iterative process. <laughs> so it's sort of like, a, you know, you're, you're running it through a solver and you're, 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 you're waiting for it to ultimately converge. So I'm minimizing the summation of every single data point, the, the difference between the regression line and, the, and the, the fair value, the logarithmic difference. So that's what I'm doing on every data point. We're summing it up minimizing it through an iterative function. And, and then this is what you get. You get the red line. And what's what I think is fascinating about the red line is it it does tend to be 
you know, fairly, it, it does a pretty good job, I think, of like, showing the macro bull markets and then the, like, the macro bear markets, right? Like, so like, when we're above it, obviously, things are a bit heated. When we're below it, uh, a lot of people aren't as interested in crypto. But really, that's the, the, the best time to be to be getting in if history is the indication. Um, and then the green lines are are basically just translations of of that curve, you know, just shifting it um, to really show And I mean, it didn't have to work out this way. You know, it, it's not like it had to be an exact fit. But, um, you know, if you shift that red line down just a little bit, it does a pretty good job of of capturing all the all the bottles or coming relatively close to doing so. And then you can you can come up with a similar trend line. Um, at the top to connect to connect the three the three pr prior macro peaks that we saw in 2011, 2013, and and 2017. So the the point is is just to try to get a, a you know it's not a short term chart right like we don't have no idea what's going to happen in a week or uh, a month or anything like that. But what we can see is that over time, the fair value goes up. Again, monotonically increasing, that means it never goes down. We just spin periodic phases below it or above it. And so the, the best thing to do is just kind of recognize where we are. If we're extended, you probably, it, it, you're probably you probably better off having like a, a bearish bias. Like if we're really far extended by like several hundred percent, like three or four hundred percent, probably better to have a bearish bias. But if we're under it by 50 percent, then you're probably better off, better suited having a bullish bias. You know, one of the interesting things about this chart to me uh, is that when you look at those dashed green lines, uh, those bands around that uh, central tendency, it's interesting to see that it's asymmetric uh, to the upside, meaning there's a broader gap uh, between uh, the red line and the top green line than the red line and the bottom green line. Yeah, eventually, uh, eventually, I think they will ultimately converge a bit more. Uh, part of the reason for what you're seeing is just because, I mean, we, we've seen how explosive parabolic rallies can be for the asset class. I mean, it, it, it's irrational oftentimes, and it's it's so hard to know how high things will go up. But as, as time goes on, I, I do imagine that things will ultimately come back down. But you're right, it is an asymmetric thing, right? And that's sort of what has historically made crypto an asymmetric bet, um, especially back in, in 2019, 2020, it, it seemed like such a good play back then. And it, I mean, it still does today. I mean, it still does today. But you, when, you, when you look at this any given year, right? Like if you just took a snapshot of it in any given year and said, all right, you know, what do you think? If we're around the fair value, I would say, all right, well, you know, pretty much middle of the road, right? You're, it's a moderate risk. You know, we could go down, we could go up. If you showed me this chart in 2017, late 2017, it's like, oh, okay, we're getting pretty far extended here. This asymmetric bet is probably at the end of paying off and, and needs to go down for a while. But when you find yourself in the pits of a bear market, you have such a, a, a great risk to take at the time. Like there's, you know, of course, there's always that slight further downside that you could see. But as long as you have sort of like a, a two to three year time horizon, it historically has worked out really well. Yeah, you mentioned those rallies. And by the way, Ben, I'm cheating a little bit. I flipped to the next chart. Uh, looking at the next chart, you have three key points uh, that you've pointed out on those uh, rallies where we see actually it top touching uh, the top band. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. Yeah. So one of the things we've noted before is that, you know, you tend to see these like market cycle peaks and the subjectivity of market cycles is certainly there. I know not everyone agrees that market cycles are a thing. Uh, but one of the things we have seen before is at least historically, is that the time between major blow off tops tends to increase in time. Okay, so like, it, you know, you, you see the first peak on that chart happened after only about a year or so from from when we first really had data. The second one, the delta between the first and the second one was about two and a half years. The delta between the second and the third one was about four years. So, you know, I mean, in, in late 2021, obviously, we've, we've had a, a double peak so far at 64K and 69K. But we actually haven't gone to the upper regression band again, you know, not not to the top. I mean, there are no guarantees that we have to. I guess you could always argue that as the as the asset class matures, we could maybe just spend more and more time around the fair value rather than going too far below it or too far above it. But when I look at the chart, I, you know, I, I still think the asset class could could grow a lot over the coming years without having to go through, you know, a, a one to two year bear market or something. Um, so that's sort of what 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 keeps me up, like, you know, especially macro optimistic on the asset class right now is, is just kind of seeing where we are, looking at the extension 
from from the fair value and saying, yeah, like we were extended from the fair value, but not as much as we could have been. And by the way, it the extension ac- accounts for diminishing returns. So like the, the distance from the fair value to the to the green upper band is is more earlier on because again the the the, the lower band is sort of like a, a translation of the red one but the other the, the upper green one is is its own fit and so you can see the the red band to the upper upper green line it's it's compressing as time goes on right so like early on in 2011 you can see there's a lot more a, a lot more of a gap but as time goes on the green band and the red band are slowly converging together and so you know, when I look at this, I say, okay, there's three clear major peaks in the asset class. And in 2021, we had we had two local tops. I mean, there's no there's no doubt about it. They were at least local tops when you talk about a 50% correction, right? Like that is a significant correction. But I'm not I'm not convinced myself that it was like what I would call a market cycle top just because of of kind of the extension from the fair value. Uh, but furthermore, you know, we didn't actually see a blow off top. Maybe it's a sign of a maturing asset class that we didn't, you know, like like equities. Equities don't really see V tops. They see V bottoms. Commodities see V tops. Uh, so perhaps we're seeing a transition from crypto from seeing V tops to seeing more like, you know, distributive tops where you, you spend a few weeks or a few months at, at local tops before then coming back down. So that's sort of what I what I understand from from these macro these macro peaks and even in actually 2013 we had sort of an intermediate peak before the before the actual macro peak that occurred later that year so for people who are relatively new to looking at charts in this way uh you mentioned that green upper uh regression band and it, it seems as though uh that those those three peaks uh that you see on those cycles uh, are correlated very closely to that continuous curve why does that happen and what does it mean well i mean i think what it means is that people are are getting more in tune with the idea that that bubbles pop and and that every time it's front run just a little bit more okay and that's also that's also understood from the idea again of going back to diminishing returns one of the reasons i think we see diminishing returns is not just because it's harder to move the asset class but also because more market participants are understanding the name of the game and and the name of the game is you know buy when it's low, sell when it's high, right? So every time there's more and more people that sort of learned the lesson the hard way from, you know, the prior years. And so they sort of, they sort of front run it a, just a little bit more than they did last time. And so you, you not only get diminishing returns just from the perspective of, a, of an increasing market cap, but also from the idea that more and more people are tired of getting burned. And then they, they'd rather actually take profits a little bit earlier than, than maybe they would have during the last cycle just because they'd rather be early and make less money than be late and, and watch it watch it sort of disappear. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why you see that. Um, and, and, a, and a fun note here, if you, if you actually take those three peaks that you see highlighted, look at like an Arrhenius plot and you plot peak one, peak two, and peak three versus, and you plot it one over time versus peaks, it actually, it actually puts the next peak in 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 August of um, 2023, uh, which is interesting because it's not really a time when a lot of people I think would imagine a peak would occur, <laughs> uh, but but that is actually when when the next one would occur based on 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 um, extrapolating. Which again, any scientist, any good scientist will say that extrapolation is a very dangerous thing, and especially on our heinous plots, fit to three data points, it's extremely sensitive to prior data. So it's certainly not something you can take to the bank. But it, it does at least kind of show what we're what we're saying. Like, you know, it's taken longer to, to, to realize those gains in the past. And therefore, it could take longer this time as well. You know, you said something interesting where you talked about, you know, people learning this lesson. And I think it's important for people who are relatively new uh, to looking at charts in this way and trying to think these uh, things through. Uh, that what you're looking at here is not a model from physics. It's a model really of human behavior. And what you're seeing uh, is human beings interacting with price uh, and what their reactions are to it. Yeah, I think so. And, and it... More, more every time people learn their lesson, they they front run it just a little bit more the next time, and and you can actually also see that on the downside. Like look look back at 2014, or, or sorry, 2015, 2016, we sort of rode that that bottom part of that curve for a long time, whereas in 2019 and 2020 we kept staying above it. And it's like I, I think part of the reason is because 
there were a lot more people that had faith in Bitcoin returning to its all-time high back in 2018, even when it was at $3,000. There was a lot more people back then than there were in 2014. That, that you know, because it, I, I was even in crypto in 2014, and I wasn't even fully convinced myself that Bitcoin would return to its prior all time high when it had fallen from like $1,200 back to less than $200. And you know, we didn't have all this data, we didn't know exactly what was going to come. Um, and every every rally just seemed like it got sold off every single time. And you can see during that time, we were at the lower part of the range more. So, I, I think it shows there was kind of less confidence back then. Than there, than there was in the last bear market, even though the last bear market was fairly brutal. I mean, a lot of a lot of cryptocurrencies lost significant amounts. Even Bitcoin was down 80% or so. Um, it does look like there was a bit more confidence and a bit more conviction in the idea that Bitcoin would eventually hit, hit new all-time highs. Well, you know, it's an interesting point, uh, and it talks to the importance and the power of looking at things on logarithmic scales. When people look at uh, those charts and they see 1,200 to 200 decline, uh, on a linear y axis, it looks like, you know, it looks like a blip. Uh, but when you look at these uh, on a linear scale, and you see the percentage change, obviously very significant. Exactly. Yeah. So then, you know, looking at the last chart, where we look at the logarithmic regression curve, the next obvious step to take is to say, well, we know that the extension from the fair value to the overvalued region, that upper green line, we can see that it's being compressed over time, right? The natural step to take would be to take the percent difference between the market cap of the asset class and the fair value. Take the percent difference of it. And on this chart, we're actually shifting it by 100% because we're putting the percent difference on a logarithmic scale as well. Um, and, and so that anything under 100% is actually undervalued. Okay, so again, it's shifted by 100%. So anything below 100% is actually representing an undervaluation. Everything above 100% is representing a slight overvaluation. This chart. Is, is really what shows uh, what we really discussed on the last chart, the idea that you see diminishing extension from the fair value. The first peak went above it by about, uh, the, the first market cycle peak went above the fair value by approximately 2,000%. The second one only went above it by, let's say, 1,200% or so. The third one, about eight or 900%. So then the fourth one, we're sort of, we're, you know, we're looking at it today and saying, well, you know, I mean, so far we've gone above it by about 300%. Is there a chance that that's all we get for the next three years? Oh, there's a chance. There's also a chance that we see it surge back in late 2022 or something, maybe in 2023. And, and we go back up to the top of that line and we ultimately see some type of like a 400 to 500% extension from the fair value, which again is shifted by 100%. So then it would be a three to 400% shift. Remember, a 300% shift is a 4x, or a 400% shift is a 5x. And if the fair value now is 1.5 trillion, you know, by the end of this year, the fair value is going to be approximately 2 trillion. Um, if you think about it, a you know, a 5x on a on a on a 2 trillion dollar valuation, that gets you to 10 trillion. Or a 4x on say a 2.5 trillion valuation gets you to 10 trillion, which it won't. I mean, the fair value won't hit 2.5 trillion until I believe sometime in in 2023. So the idea is that you know the macro idea, at least anyways, is that the asset class has a real chance of hitting 10 trillion um, within the next couple of years. And I, I know it seems unlikely, especially given the macro uncertainty right now with with what's going on in the world and and you know inflation and, and the fed rolling over the balance sheet i understand that there's a lot of uncertainty there i also understand that that uh markets can also do what you kind of least expect them to do as well um and so we need to we need to keep a close eye on on this if it, if it does end up going back up to a you know several hundred percent overvalued over the next let's call it 18 months or something, and then there's a good chance we're looking at another market cycle peak. You know, this is just one of those charts that, that really shows the overvaluation versus undervaluation. And the point, the, the, one of the points that I, I like to make about this chart is that, you know, no one really knows where it's going to go. But really, I think investing is just a lot of if-then statements. You know, like if it goes to the undervaluation area, it's historically a great time. It's a great a, a great risk to take if history is any indication. But if it if it goes up to the higher overvaluation area, then you have to understand that you know you're 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 fighting uh, a losing battle at that point because it, it cannot it cannot sustain those levels of overvaluation for more you know for for very long periods of time. So if we go to the top 
all dot trend line, it's, there's a good chance we're going to have to come back down for a while. Or if we go to the bottom at that point, there's a much higher chance we start to go back to the top. Yeah, and I should probably add, uh, to put this in a context in terms of absolute quanta, the dollar value rather than percentage change, uh, right now we're at one8 trillion dollars uh, on a market cap basis uh, or total network value basis across digital assets. So that does put some uh, perspective on this $10 trillion uh, number. Uh, it is obviously quite a significant increase from where we are right now, Ben. It is. And one of the interesting things is, you know, we have, I, I publish this chart on my YouTube channel every month. On the first of every month, I, I, I talk about this chart. And when we first started talking about it, um, the asset class was around 100 to 200 billion when we first started talking about it, potentially going to 10 trillion by, by you know, mid to late 2023 or something. Um, so yeah, it, you know, going from a, a two and a half or a, a two trillion dollar market cap to 10 trillion, it's a lot. You know, it, it certainly is a lot, and it, it might take longer than than 2023. But when you consider how far we've come from 100 to 200 billion, it's already gone up 10x. You know. So yeah, for, to, to one degree, to, to some degree, it is a, it's a huge step. I do think we'll eventually make it to 10 trillion. I mean, if, it, if I'm hoping it happens in 2023, if it doesn't, then I mean, I still think it'll eventually make it there. But considering how far we've come, it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's completely out of the question, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, to precisely your point, I remember people talking about this idea of a $1 trillion capitalization uh, for digital assets in general as almost a sort of a fanciful number. And here we are at almost two. Right. And we actually went to three already. I mean, we already went to three trillion earlier in, in um, 2021 or so. So, you know, I mean, to go up three X, you're, you're, you're basically talking about like, what would that equate to crypto prices? Three to four X, you're talking about a Bitcoin price that's somewhere between one to 200,000. You know, you're, you're talking about an Ethereum price, it's probably somewhere between 10 to 20,000 whenever we get there. So that, that's ultimately what, what I'm really looking for as a whole for the asset class over over the coming years. Ben, before we go to the next chart, I wanted to ask a question. We're looking at total uh, capitalization across digital assets. How does this look relative to Bitcoin? Obviously, Bitcoin now, uh, when we look at something called BDI, Bitcoin Dominance Index, it's about 42% uh, of the total capitalization across digital assets. How do these sort of uh, models work with Bitcoin uh, if we just isolate Bitcoin on them? Yeah, so if you, if you just look at Bitcoin, it's likely looking like a, a six-figure Bitcoin. Um, probably not. You're probably not looking at like a $500,000 Bitcoin in the next two years, but you, you could be looking at a one to $200,000 Bitcoin in the next two years. So that's sort of how it directly relates to Bitcoin. It's easy to, to sort of put a multiple on the entire asset class because some altcoins can go up a lot more than Bitcoin. But when, when isolating Bitcoin and thinking about the Bitcoin dominance and, and where ultimately we might imagine it could be, at, at a future peak, I would I would I would think about a, a one hundred to two hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, which would basically represent, you know, somewhere between two and a half x to five x from the current price. And then that's using similar models in terms of the uh, regressions and the banding. Correct. You can actually fit the same the same logarithmic regression style upper band to just the price of Bitcoin. And and you'll you'll see a very a very similar a very similar trend. Actually, we have a chart uh, that shows that as well. Um, if you look at at slide number five, you can see the the over like the the just the price of Bitcoin. You can see both the green fair value logarithmic regression band fit to quote unquote non bubble data, and then the the upper logarithmic regression band, which is just looking at at major peaks in the market. And right now, we sort of just remain in no man's land. Really, I mean, you know, we're we're sort of in the middle. We're not we're not at the bottom. We're not at the top. You know, back in in the summer of 2021, I, I had some people say, "Well, since we already kind of went to the top, does that mean we have to go to the bottom?" And I said, "I said no." And look, I mean, we we didn't, right? We went back up to close to the top again. So I would argue that we are we're sort of just in no man's land right now. We are we're in a phase where there's a risk if you want to take it. There's also uncertainty going on in the world. We don't really know what could happen if, you know, if things get, get a lot worse. So you know, I look at this chart and if you look at that red band, you can see that the lower part of the red band is, is getting, you know, it, it's the entire band as a whole is, is going to be above a hundred thousand in, in not, in not a, in not a super long period of time. I mean, in 2023, Remember, this is a logarithmic scale, so it kind of played tricks on you. But that band in 2023 is going to be over 100K and, and as high as, as 
So I, I look at this uh, sort of this range that we're in right now as saying we're in no man's land. You know, there, there's a chance we go down, there's a chance we go up. I prefer to have a bullish bias because I just think the asset class is going to generally grow. Um, but sort of like right now, we're, we're sort of playing ping pong between the upper and lower regression band. We're not really going into either one of them. We sort of went to the very bottom part of the upper one and then came back down. And now we're actually closer to the bottom one. The upper part of the lower regression band is at, is actually now at 30K, which is interesting because that's also the bottom of the uh, that's also the, the the bottom that we more or less hit in the summer of 2021 as well. So going back to to slide number four, um, this is the same chart we looked at earlier. But one of the interesting things uh, about this chart is that it, it really shows like th there's so much uncertainty in in when things can happen. You know, we all like to predict when it's going to occur. Again, my best guess that I've said for a long time is probably the summer of 2023. But in terms of reaching that upper upper band. The earliest the asset class as a whole could hit 10 trillion would be this summer. I don't personally think it's going to hit 10 trillion this summer. Um, it's just that the if you look at the upper regression band and say, okay, well, when when is the earliest period of time where the upper regression band hits 10 trillion? You can see that it's actually in the summer of 2022. But also, if you if you go back and look and say, well, it first crossed one trillion. Um, or well, let's say it first crossed 100 billion in the middle of 2023, but the asset class as a whole didn't get to 100 billion until later that year. So well, when I look at these models, I just sort of try to remain to per maintain some perspective on it. Look at the lower bound, look at the upper bound, try to put a, a general timeline on it and say, you know, whenever it occurs, you really want to be paying attention. But I, at this point, you know, why don't we go on to, to another chart that I, I think is actually really useful? And it's, it's slide number six. And the reason I like this chart, this is sort of like the flagship metric that I, I use um, on my channel and, and in general to navigate Bitcoin specifically. And it's essentially what it is. It's the risk level of, of Bitcoin. And it's basically just based on prior movements in the asset class or in Bitcoin. It's looking at, at volatility. It's looking at dimensioning returns. And, and what this is, is it's showing the risk of Bitcoin and it's color coded from from blue to red. So blue represents low risk, close to zero. Red represents high risk, close to one. And the idea, generally speaking, is that you know there's no there's no solution that fits every investor. Okay, there's always someone saying they're selling. There's always someone saying they're buying. They're buying. There's always someone making fun of either person depending on what they think. But really. Everyone has a different risk tolerance. And, and what my risk tolerance is can be different from someone else's risk tolerance. So what I, what I stress is that there are some people that are comfortable buying Bitcoin below, say, 0.3 risk or 0.4 risk or 0.5 risk. But there are other people that, that would buy Bitcoin all the way up to 0.7 risk. They don't care because they, they, you know, they're, they're not really interested in the shorter term moves, even on a, even on a yearly basis. They just want to accumulate, accumulate, accumulate for the next decade, no matter what happens. But when I look at this chart, what it tells me is that they are somewhat predictable, at least when the market is too overheated. This metric was published on my channel back in, I believe it was late 2019. So sometime, sometime after we had hit 14K, I, I first started talking about this metric on my YouTube channel. And since then, we saw it's been stress tested <laughs> to some degree, because in March of 2020, we dropped to $3,800. And at the time, that represented 0.12 risk. So it was a very, very low risk level. You can see it on the chart, that sort of that capitulation in March of 2020. And then following that, we sort of went back into an accumulation zone for a while. And then we had our parabolic rally where the risk level ultimately topped at around 0.94 risk. Unfortunately, it, to be brutally honest, it did not hit the top exactly because when it hit 0.94 risk, it actually corresponded to $58,000 back in early 2021. So I was, you know, I was, I was very bearish on Bitcoin at that time, not because I don't think it can trend higher, but because it had moved up so quickly. It had moved up so much in too short of a period of time is the problem. Um, so, so we saw it go up to the highest risk levels, and then it came back down to you know, some of the lower risk levels, and then sort of went back up. We're sort of just in, again, we're, we're sort of at a, at a moderate risk level that the current risk right now, according to this metric, is 0.36, meaning, look, as long as you have the right macro outlook, 
it still seems somewhat reasonable. But in the short term, you know, there are lower risk levels we could go to in the event that, that things get worse. But, but over the macro scale, what I look for is I look to say, okay, below a certain risk level, I'm fine accumulating. And above a certain risk level, I stop accumulating and I sort of let things sit. And then if we hit a certain risk level, like above a certain area, then I actually start start um, taking profit. So this is basically just a, a metric to help me navigate the asset class and to kind of recognize when it's getting too overheated, when it's very, very undervalued, and to try to sort of separate the emotions of of what we're feeling with, with what's going on from like a more quantitative perspective. Ben, let me ask you this about the construction of this chart, because it is very clear and very crisp uh, in showing that level of risk as you interpret it. Uh, is this essentially just another mechanism of expressing uh, the logarithmic regression and the bands that we looked at earlier? Or is there additional data in this chart relative uh, to some of the other models that we viewed earlier in the show? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually get that question a lot. I, I think there is a tendency for for people to think that it's just sort of like based on the logarithmic regression um, channels, but it's actually not. It, it's a, it, it actually has no idea about these logarithmic regression bands. It's a completely separate metric, which is one of the things I like to do. I like to create metrics that are are not dependent on each other so much because if you do that, then you you when you see some type of confluence. You might be seeing confluence just because it's basing everything off the same metric, not because there's actually a difference in, in what's going on. So I think it's very useful to, to look at a lot of different metrics and see if there's a lot of confluence. For instance, back in early 2021, not only were we banging on the door of the upper regression band at around 60K, we were also in the 0.9 to 1 wristband, which, by the way, we never spend more than a few days in those wristbands. Uh, you know, if you look at prior market cycles, every time we go to that highest wristband, we're only there for it's just a few fleeting days. The 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 euphoria at the time is is like it's hard to it's hard to imagine unless you're actually in it. You know, um, but we we ultimately do not sustain those levels, and then and then market participants are are kind of punished for a while uh, at, at lower prices, and and we just kind of have to continue the grind for a while. And then eventually we'll, we'll go back up, right? We'll, we'll go back into a, more than likely, we'll go back into a, a, a rally at some point, but it's just a matter of being patient and, and waiting and, and recognizing that it's a long-term game. We were talking a little bit off camera about HODL waves. Yeah, so one of the interesting things about crypto in general is that we have access to data that you don't really have for a lot of other asset classes, and that's on-chain data. And of course, there's always the, the, the typical disclaimer of on-chain data and that it doesn't capture everything. You know, it doesn't, it certainly does not capture everything. It does not have to capture what happens on exchanges. Um, it, it doesn't even necessarily know if, if a transfer out is a buy or a sell or if it's just a transfer to another wallet. But it does tell an interesting story. And this on-chain data uh, is provided by CoinMetrics. We have the HODL waves here, as you can see. And each one is color-coded by a, a different sort of um, group of people who have held that Bitcoin for a certain amount of time. And one of the things you'll notice is you see these things sort of roll over at, at, certain, peak, at certain peaks or right after the peak. And one of the reasons is because a lot of people are, are making moves in their portfolio during that time, whereas other times they're not making moves in their portfolio and, and therefore the, the Bitcoin being held in certain wallets is continuing to age. But what's interesting, if you go to the next slide, so, so look at this slide. This is a hot ways for everything, going from holding it to less than one day in the red to going to holding it for more than 10 years in the purple. But one of the things we can do is we can isolate something and say, well, what about, let's call them long-term holders. So anyone who has been holding Bitcoin for at least six months, and, and we're gonna we're gonna do away with all the other ones. What do you notice when you look at this chart? Well, you see it dip down significantly at, at peaks. If you look at 2011, you see a fairly big dip, right? Right at the peak, right at the peak, you see a fairly big dip in, in the long-term holder HODL waves when just looking at, again at people who have been holding for at least six months or more. What's also interesting is you see two dips in 2013. You see one in the middle of 2013 at the first intermediate peak, and you've seen another one following the final peak. In, in late 2013. You also see a big dip in late 2017 and early 2018. You can see that clear, like that V that forms at the in the HODL wave before it goes back up 
when we are in reaccumulation and and when we're sort of just waiting for the next one to occur. What I find really fascinating about this metric, and I actually fall into this category myself, to be completely honest, is there's a huge V sort of formation in the in the hodl wave at the first peak at 64k. And actually, that's where that's where I was uh, pretty aggressive in profit taking myself. But at the 69k peak, uh, I don't know if it's me just trying to rationalize uh, missing it or something, but there's really not a lot of of change in the long term holder behavior at that point. You can see that there was no there was no drawdown. I, I think one of the reasons, and my best interpretation of it, is that the longer term players in the game who who potentially were accumulating Bitcoin back at 3k and at 5k and at 10k and whatnot. If they were going to take profits, they probably did so more likely during the first move, you know, to, to the 60k area. When it went back down for three months, and then we had another move up, my my sort of understanding is that longer term holders weren't as likely to take profits because a lot of them, if they had already taken profits, their their current Bitcoin might not have even been in long term capital gains territory, which may have played an impact as well. Or they just started to accumulate for for the long haul again after seeing a 50% correction. A lot of times you'll get a lot of new buyers once Bitcoin retraces 50%. And we saw that. We went to 64K, then we went back down to 28K, 29K. You will see a lot of long-term holders start to you know, add back to their stack once you see that 50% correction. So when I look at this, I say, okay, well, we see a pretty substantial peak in May, according to the long-term holders. We don't really see anything in November, so it was sort of like a bounce, um, but did not really it did not really lead to any major new all time highs. And normally, when Bitcoin puts in a new all time high, it continues to put in new all time highs, you know, for 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 months to come. But this time, this time we didn't. So what it tells me is that you know while there is of course there's short term uncertainty in the market, there are a lot of longer term investors that that have conviction in in Bitcoin. And and they're still fine accumulating even even at these prices. They're they're not as likely to, to to sell right now as they were back in early 2021. And what you're sort of seeing is the market, I think, is becoming more accustomed accustomed to what the new normal is. Anytime you see rapid price appreciation, it takes a while for the market to accept it that that is actually say, like the fair value of the asset before it can actually sustainably push higher. So I think what we've seen is we've seen like a kind of like a a hurry up and wait mentality where Bitcoin used to be at 10K and it was sort of like, all right, hurry up and go up to, you know, the the, the forty thousand dollar range plus or minus 10K on either side, and then just wait, because that's all we've been doing for the last year. So I look at this and say, you know what, I think the asset class is is just slowly maturing. You're seeing people are, are becoming more accustomed to the new normal, and you're seeing long-term holders continue to 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 hold on to their conviction. And you you don't really see a, a huge sell off by by long term holders at this stage. And then one more thing that we can we can look at we you know we've talked about logarithmic regression. We, we've talked about um, on chain data. We can also look at social statistics. And I, I think social statistics are interesting because they tell something that on chain data does not tell. On chain data is really great at telling you about the supply side of things, right? A lot of on-chain data is really good about talking about supply. But what about if we want to know more about demand? One of the ways I think we can learn about demand is by looking at, at social metrics. And one of the one of the charts here, these are the data provided by Social Blade. We have two charts. We have new weekly YouTube subscribers on, on the first chart. And then on the second chart, we have weekly new crypto subreddit comments. You know, these are things that a lot of people might not even think to look at, right? Like, what is, you know, what is the general sentiment in the space? But retail is, is they're not as present right now as they were back in early 2021. And, and that's a fact. And you can see that, you know, from, from looking at, at new YouTube subscribers, not only to my channel, but a lot of other cryptocurrency channels as well, new, ch- new subscribers are down significantly. Additionally, new Reddit posts are down or comments are down significantly. And one of the reasons we see that is after Bitcoin sort of puts in a major uh, a major new sort of paradigm shift at 64k, you sort of see a surge of retail come back. There it's a lagging indicator to some degree. They don't they don't really show up until the new all-time highs occur. So one of the things that I think this metric would be really useful to to show is once Bitcoin puts in a new all-time high, 
do we see a surge of retail come back? One of the interesting things about the 69K secondary peak that happened in late 20, 2021, what you notice is that we didn't really see a surge of retail comeback. I mean, look at look at look at the new the new subreddit comments that we see. It was just it's just been in a downtrend, even even though Bitcoin did put in a new all time high. New YouTube subscribers, yeah, we saw a little bit of a bump, but it was not a sustained thing yet. So uh, this is just one more indicator that we can look at. If Bitcoin sort of musters up the courage to get back to new all time high, do we see a lot of retail come with it? Are they you know are they flocking back to it? Or does it still sort of wane? And if it wanes, then you might you might argue, well, you know, th this is likely not going to be a sustained short term breakout. But if retail comes back, then it it would I think it would give more credit to the idea that it is a sustained breakout, and that we are going to trend higher. So I think by you know by taking social metrics, um, by taking in logarithmic regression, extensions, that kind of stuff, by looking at on chain data. It really does tell you, it really can help you kind of understand where we are, what are the risks involved, and, and then you have to just figure out if you're, if you're willing to take those risks or not. Ben, really interesting charts, looking at this in ways that some people I'm sure probably have not seen before. Fantastic analysis. I hope you'll come back and join us again soon. For sure. I'd love to, love to come back. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for watching, everyone. Hey there, revolutionaries. Thanks for tuning in. For more content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto and get unfiltered access to the most brilliant minds in finance and crypto. Join our community of lifelong learners for exclusive access, unparalleled education, and unbiased insights.